uh, we've been teaching on superheroes of faith, how that uh, the story in the Bible where you had a supervillain that subjugated man and God sent a deliverer, Jesus Christ, and in the Old Covenant, how God anointed many men and women that were deliverers. And how many know that in Christ, you're a somebody's deliverer. God's anointed you to bring deliverance to somebody, to heal somebody, to bring salvation to that house. Now, actually, I, lo I love this little caption. Here's Jesus talking to some of the fictitious superheroes, saying, and that's how I saved the world. And that's how I saved the world. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, it sounds so impersonal when we say the world, but how about you? He loved you so much. If you were the only one, he would have still come and died for you because he loves you so, so much. Let's look at the next slide. If you can get to the next slide. There you go. Jesus Christ is the real Avenger. I know there's a popular uh, movie called The Avengers. Jesus is the real Avenger, and he's coming back. There's a whole lot of things going on in the world today, but Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back in your lifetime, and I need to tell you he's coming back, and, and we can live with that expectancy. I often say, what would you do if you thought you had a month left to live or a few weeks left to live? How would you live differently? You know, I believe Jesus is coming back again in our lifetime, but what if your lifetime was to end before that? What if something would happen before that? Would you live differently? We need to live with that expectancy that we're just passing through this life. And one day, we're going to be in glory. We're going to be with him. But he is coming back, and he's coming back in your lifetime. Let's look at the next slide. Now, we talked about some of the uh, Avengers, if you will. We talked about David and Goliath, and we talked about Samson and Noah. And today, we're going to talk about Jonah. So often, we, we don't really hear too many messages about Jonah because we teach it in, the, in a, like a Sunday school class to children, and it's like a nice story, but it's truth. It happened, and there's a prophetic message that God wants us to, to get. It's not just a nice Sunday school story, but it's a prophetic truth that God wants each and every one of us to get. Let's look at the next slide. Now, again, I'll just remind you about David. The, you see... The, the, what happened with David and Goliath, there's principles in his life that we can actually utilize, that we can take from his life, that God put in, it, in the Word to show us what we can do in our situation. And David showed us that you need to be a giant on the inside. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you've got the greater one in you, you can face anything that life brings. And listen, life gives you pop quizzes. Everything's going fine. All of a sudden, you get a pop quiz. You get a phone call from a doctor, and you got bad news, or the mortgage company calls, and you have to come out with a whole extra payment or things happen in life crisis is normal to life and it doesn't mean that you sinned or doesn't mean that you did wrong because you're in a crisis crisis is normal to life sometimes we get in a crisis and we think oh what did I do wrong sometimes it's because you're doing right you're just doing right you're just in life crisis is normal to life but God gives us grace and God gives us faith and God gives us favor so we can get through all the crises of life I'm here to tell you I've been walking with God 28 years and he's delivered me from every crisis he's delivered me from lawsuits and he's delivered me from every sickness he's delivered me financially he's delivered me he's delivered me we recently had a problem come up where uh, I'll say an 80 something thousand dollar problem I'm not talking church I'm talking personal where I went, oh God, what am I going to do? But I remembered, I said, God, you delivered me every time in the past of huge problems that were just so big to me. I've even brought, once I, once I got a knock at my door, and uh, they said, are you Mr. Pedrera? And I, I wanted to say, no, I don't know where he's at. <laughs> it was a policeman at the door, but I know you can't say that. And, and, and he began reading me, I was being sued for $70,000 for something I didn't do. So I said, what did you do? I came to church and I put it on the altar, and I said, do you see this? Do you see this, God? <laughs> <laughs> you know what happened? He delivered me totally, completely. Amen? It's completely, totally delivered me. Just this week, I got news again. That, that other problem that would have cost me like 80000 delivered. God delivered me again. Glory to God. He did it again. He did it again. I want to tell you a funny story. I was sharing this. I went down to the television station to bring our, our weekly uh, teachings. And I went there one day, and I felt like, don't, don't give this week. Have them play Standing on the Promises. And I thought, okay, God, I'll do, I'll do that. So I just called him and I said, go ahead and play Standing on the Promises, one that we played before, so rerun. And it was Thursday night, and it was about 11.15, and I was sitting there in, in a room, and I said, hey, you know, I forgot what I, what I preached on there. Let me, let me turn on the TV. And at the time, I was going through another lawsuit through one of my businesses. I'm a businessman, and one of my businesses is another problem, something I didn't do again, just Satan trying to attack me. And Because I, I was waiting for a word from God, and God's got a sense of humor. 
And I'm on the television, and I said, are you going through a lawsuit? I went, yes! <laughs> this is me! And he said, <laughs> he said say it now. God's going to do it again. I said, God's going to do it again! God's going to do it again! And I start cracking up laughing because I'm prophesying to myself over the television. I said, God, you have a sense of humor. And he sure enough did it again, delivered me again, amen? Let's look at the next slide. God's Avengers, Samson. Now, we all talk about Samson's mighty strength where he tore apart a lion and he did so many feats of strength. But what did his life teach us? Number one is it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. As Christians, you're not powerless. God has anointed you with the Holy Ghost. God has put an anointing on your life, a yoke-destroying anointing. My dog, Buddy, he gets into situations that he, he's on a run, he's on a, a dog run, and he, he wraps himself around the tree. And sometimes I look at how that cord's wrapped up. There is absolutely no way he's going to get out unless a higher intelligence comes and shows him the way out. He just can't figure it out. And guess what? Sometimes we're like Buddy. We get tangled up in sin. We get tangled up in life. And we need God to deliver us by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. There's some things you're just not going to get set free unless God sets you free. There's some things aren't going to get broken off of your life unless God breaks it off of your life. Unless God gives you the wisdom how to get out. Just like I lead Buddy out and he's so happy getting let out. That's why he's called the good shepherd, right? There's some things we're just not going to get free no matter how hard we try. It's the anointing of the Spirit of God and God leading us in our life that will bring us freedom and deliverance. So it's not by might nor by power but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Now let's look at the next slide. Here's Noah. We talked about Noah last week. And now Noah, what does Noah's life teach us? He built an ark to the saving of his house. It might have been, some of us, and we talked about this last week, it wasn't necessarily 120 years that he built the ark. We don't know how long it was, but he built this ark in faithfulness. What if it was 70 years? What if it was 80 years? He stayed at the same thing God said. You know, if you're faithful in a little thing, God will give you a big thing. You say, Pastor Joe, I'm going to tithe to the church when I win the lottery, but you don't tithe on $10, and when the lottery comes, you're going to get in all kind of trouble. Remember this, money only magnifies what you are. If you're a wise person, you'll be a magnificent wise person. If you're a fool, you'll be a magnified fool because you won't know what to do with your money. Right? That's the truth. It's the truth. So if you're faithful in the little things, if you're driving through a McDonald's or Burger King and they give you extra change, do you go, praise God, I got money for the day? Or do you say, wait a minute, this isn't mine? Those are the things that happen in life. I remember once coming out of a Home Depot and I had extra paint that they never scanned and I brought it back in and the lady was surprised that I brought the paint back in. I said, this isn't mine. I don't want stolen paint, putting stolen paint on a house that I was going to work on. I said, no, no, no. I only want what belongs to me. I don't want what doesn't belong to me. So if you're faithful in the little things, you'll be faithful in the big things. And here God asked Noah to build an ark to the saving of his house and he stayed faithful at it. Whatever you do, and it might seem like a mundane task. Maybe you're teaching children at church on Sunday and God's got a call on your life. Listen, I was called to preach the gospel t uh, 28 years ago. Angelic visitation. You're called to preach the gospel and guess what God had me do? I was cutting grass at church. <laughs> called to preach. That's what I was doing, cutting grass, painting on the building, just doing whatever I had to be done, teaching children. I was an usher in the house of God. God just had me in all these things. Just be faithful in the little things, and God will exalt you to big things. Maybe you want a big business, start small. Despise not the day of small beginnings. Just the other day, somebody asked me, they said, how many people do you have in your church? I said, well, I'm the pastor of a 5,000-member church. They said, what? I said, yeah, I'm missing 4,850-some-odd people, but I'm their pastor. They don't know it yet. I'm their pastor. So despise not the day of small beginnings. I want to reach a lot of people for Christ and bless a lot of people. A lot of people are hurting and they need healing, need deliverance and restoration. Now, many man proclaims his own loving kindness and goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Guys, I want to encourage you. Maybe you're just working hard at a job. You're getting full of grease. Maybe you feel unappreciated. You have a boss that doesn't like you. Let me tell you, you're working for the family. The job is for the family, and you're doing that for your family. Sometimes, guys, we put up with some stuff from people at work, but you're doing it for your family, and it's a sacrifice. And I honor, I honor every father, every man of God that's working hard, taking care of business at work, going to that job faithful and taking care of his family. You are a a hero you are a man of God and I honor you today because that is a mighty mighty thing that you're doing sometimes ladies we put up with some stuff I don't know if you, you realize you, you you know you come home from work your wife says how was work you go fine you just don't even want to talk about it you just don't want to even mention it sometimes but I know that guys you put up with some stuff I know in the working world I put up so, with so much stuff I still do because I have businesses I understand very, very difficult, but God gives us grace, and we're doing that for the family. Let's look at the next slide. Now, in talking about Jonas, we've got to talk about 
the outrageous love of God. God's love is outrageous. So often we look at love and we, we base it on our relationships. You know, I love you if you love me, but God's love is not that way. He loves you. He bestows his grace and his love on your life. And his outrageous love is love that never gives up. It's love that's unfailing. It's love that reaches you and loves you in your darkest place. It's love that embraces the very worst in you. See, love is not blind. You've heard that said before. Love is blind. It's not blind. Love sees and still loves. Love is a choice. Marriages sometimes get into trouble. You say, I've fallen out of love. I, I like to say, fall back in love. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. Not based on, you know, some of those songs, Feelings or a Barry Manilow song where you get a bunch of chill bumps and you think you're in love. No. Love is a choice. I remember I, I met a young lady and you know, she had met somebody, and I said, listen, is he ready to, if, if you ever got crippled or hurt, is he going to push you around in a wheelchair and take care of you? Love will do that, you know. I know we have someone in the family that had that happen, and he's still caring and loving for his wife. Love is not blind. Love is a choice, and we make that choice, and feelings follow the choice. Say, I'm going to choose to love you, even if you don't love me back. I'm going to choose to love you, and it's, it's a choice, and feelings follow choice. Let's look at the next slide. So with Jonah, uh, Psalms 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, we're, we're going to go out and eat lunch today, and we're going to taste some food, and if it's good, you're going to go, Oh, man, this is just so good. This is just, this is awesome. You got to go eat here. You go to a restaurant. You want to tell all your friends, man, you got to have this dish at the restaurant. You got to eat this at the restaurant because it's so good. And you see, when we taste of God's goodness, you want to tell everybody about him. I got saved, and I got filled with the Holy Ghost, and I was talking to everybody, and they say, Why are you telling me this? Why are you always preaching? Why are you always talking about Jesus? I said, he's just so good. He's just so good. It's, it's just that good. I, I just can't wait to tell people because it's so good and I want you to have the goodness. And sometimes people don't realize it because they haven't tasted it. But once you taste it, you go, wow, wow, he is good. He is so good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Now here you have the, uh, Jonah with the fish. The fish vomited him out where he was supposed to be. And we're going to talk about that in a second. It says the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now I have Jonah saying, thank you, Lord. There's two ways out of that fish. And he got the easy way out, right? He got the easy way out. Rebellion tastes bad. There's the fish spitting him out. Rebellion tastes bad. Let's look at the next slide. Now, this is a story uh, that happened in 1891. Uh, you, you can go look this up. And I want to read this to you because sometimes, uh, you know, it, it takes a good theologian sometimes to get in trouble, uh, if you will, and get lost because they try to doubt the word of God. And how many know the Bible says God prepared a fish for Jonah? So this is a true story, but this is another true story I want to tell you here. And it says the Yarmouth Mercury on August 22nd, 1891, carried a story entitled Man in a Whale's Stomach, Rescue of a Modern Jonah. In February of 1891, James Bartley was a seaman aboard the whaling ship Star of the East. While the ship was near the Falkland Islands, a lookout spotted a sperm whale several miles off. Two boats were launched. One succeeded in harpooning the whale, but the second was upended by the whale's tail and his crew tossed into the water. One man drowned and another Bartley could not be found. Let's look at the next slide. The whale was killed and hauled to the side of the ship where the crew set to work carving up the carcass. The next morning, they hoisted the stomach on deck and were surprised to see signs of life. Inside, they found the unconscious Bartley, who they doused with seawater and soon revived. For two weeks, he was a raving lunatic, but by the end of the third week, he fully recovered. Bartley recalled being swallowed by a great darkness, then slipping along a smooth passage until he came into a larger space. Let's look at the next slide. It says he felt slimy stuff around him and realized he'd been swallowed by the whale. He could breathe, but the heat sucked the energy out of him, and eventually he passed out. The only lasting effect of the incident was that the skin of his face, neck, and hands were bleached to the color of parchment or paper by the whale's gastric juices. So here you have a picture of just as this is a whale shark. Now, a whale shark's mouth can open four to five feet. And there's a lot of other whales. The Bible does not specifically say it was a whale. It says a great fish. How many know God could make a fish just for you? God could make a fish especially for you, and God made a fish and prepared a fish for Jonah, created a fish for Jonah, I believe, whether it was a whale or whether it was a great fish, it was a very large fish that swallowed him. And let's look at the next slide. Now, Jonah 1 and 1 says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, Jonah did not like this assignment. There's going to be some assignments you get from God that you're not going to like. You're working with a boss or working with someone you don't like, and God's saying, I want you to take them to lunch today. I want you to bless them today. And you're like, bless them? Bless them with a brick, God. 
You know, the, David prayed in precatory psalms. And precatory psalms are this, break their teeth, oh God, you know, that kind of stuff. But just like I told you about Samson, how he tore a lion apart, I find it harder loving your enemies, those that don't love you back, those that don't reciprocate that love, those that don't treat you right. The natural response is to treat them wrong, but God wants to love them, and that's how we show that we're children of the king. And he gets his assignment from God to go speak to the Assyrians who were so wicked and so evil. He didn't want to do it. And, and so let's look at the next slide. So in 750 B.C., I want to tell you a little bit about them. The ancient world was ruled by the Assyrians. They were cruel and a brutal people. The children of Israel were living under the Assyrians' reign of terror because they had sinned against God. Their sin brought the oppression. Remember what I'm going to tell you. Sin always brings an oppression. Sin steals from you. Sin and Satan are synonymous. It steals from us. Drug addictions take all your money. Alcohol takes all your money. Whatever it is, it just takes your money. It takes your life. It robs you of life and relationships. And, and people that live that sinful life, it even ages you. It steals years away from your life. That's why God says, I'll restore to you the years that the pommel worm and the canker worm hath eaten. Sin robbed you. He steals from you. And it says here, they were living under the Assyrians' reign of terror because they had sinned against God. They had committed all types of atrocities against the people of Israel, and Jonah hated them. Blinding, they gouged out their eyes. They beheaded them. They skinned them alive. They cut open pregnant women and cut out the baby. You say, that is so brutal, Pastor Joe, but now we do it in America, and we call it partial birth abortion, but we're just educated savages. And it happens in our land. I don't know the number of babies that have been killed in our land, but it sure is a lot. It, and that's just as brutal. Just as brutal. Let's look at the next slide. Now, this is a picture where Nineveh, Joppa, and Tarshish is at. Jonah 1.3, it says, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, in the Bible, when you see the, name, the word presence of the Lord, it also, in the Hebrew, the word presence means face, the face of God, the place where you're face-to-face -face talking with God, a place of fellowship and friendship with God. The Bible says Enoch said, not Enoch, uh, the, uh, Cain said, I'll be driven uh, from your face, from your presence, and he went and lived east of Eden. So in the Bible, going east is always going away from God. How many have ever read the scripture, as far as the east is from west, so far as he removed their sins from us? East and west never meet. East and west never meet. So going east speaks of going away from God. So Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Let's look at the next slide. Now it's amazing, again, the presence of the Lord is a place of relationship. He was running from God and his will for his life. There may be some things that God asks you to do. How many know the will of God is not comfortable? If you're going to go to a hospital call, well, I'll go as long as it's on my route. What if you have to drive 50 miles to go pray for somebody? What if you've got to go out of your way to help somebody? The will of God is not always comfortable. It's not always something you may enjoy doing. Many, many years ago, when I was in the military, God spoke to me and said, I'm going to send you somewhere you don't want to go. And I thought, well, you know, that's not exactly an encouraging word, somewhere I don't want to go. Well, I realized where that place was when the military sent me to a Mesa area of Arizona. I was in a desert in about 110 degrees looking at rattlesnakes. I'm thinking, okay, this is definitely where I don't want to go. And I, pre I would preach. I said, God, I'll just preach to everything. I'll preach to the snakes if you want. I've got to get out of here. So I, I began ministering, and there was a young lady that was listening to me that actually started coming to church after uh, she, was, she was part of the group we were in, and, and I was preaching to her, and she started coming to church after that two-week experience. And uh, so God had me there for a reason, and she got, she got together with her husband and everything, restoration. So that was a blessing. I was there for a divine assignment. Now, Psalms... 139.7 says, Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? You can't run from God, because wherever you run, he's there. He's there. Wait a minute, Pastor Joe, is he in the ballrooms? Yes, he is. When I was in the military, I was somewhere where I wasn't supposed to be, with people I shouldn't, uh, was supposed to be with, and I, was, I had just said a sinner's prayer in my life, but I wasn't really walking with God, and I'm not going to tell you what I was doing to glorify sin, but the anointing of God hit me where I was at. I mean, it hit me, and I went, I said this like this, I've sinned, and I didn't even know what it was. I ran three miles back to the base. I was, it just scared the sin right out of me. I just ran, I mean, just, you know, in boots and all, just gone. Wow. People came looking for me the next day. Hey, I was like, ah, no, no. He scared the sin out of me. So he can reach you in a ballroom. He can reach you wherever you're at. Psalms 139, 8 says, If I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Some are in the wrong bed. If you make your bed in, and you're in the wrong place, he can, he can convict you in the wrong place. If you made your bed in hell. If you made your bed in hell. You know what they say? If you sleep with dogs, you'll get fleas, right? Wherever you're at, God is there. Psalms 139.9, 9. 
If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me, thy right hand shall hold me. God pursues you. Sometimes we're trying to run from him, but he pursues you. His love will pursue you. His love brought you in here. His love pursues you and draws you to himself. He's forever drawing you to himself. Sometimes we wander. My, my dog, Buddy, I'll talk about Buddy a little bit. I have a shepherd dog. It's my son's dog. a German shepherd. And she stays around in the area, but Buddy starts sniffing. And when he starts sniffing, before you know it, he sniffs his way all down the street, doesn't realize where he's going. And some of us are like that. We start wandering from God and don't even pay attention until after a while we're so far away from God. How did I ever get it here? How did I ever get in so much trouble? Well, we start neglecting the word of God, and we start neglecting fellowship, and we start neglecting the house of God. And, and you say, yeah, I go to, I go to Bride of Dawn Church, and you had been a church in a year, which I found out, as I've shared, I have invisible members. I have invisible members uh, you know I've asked them where do you go to church they say bright adorned church uh, oh okay I haven't seen you in a long time it's invisible members right so we start drifting from God kind of like being out of the at, at, at sea and you start drifting from the beach slowly it's a slow process we begin drifting from him God is forever drawing us back to him back to that place of intimacy back to that place of fellowship now Jonah 6 44 says no man can come to me except the father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day and the drawing agent of God is the Holy Spirit who draws us to himself let's look at the next slide now Jonah 1 3 says this he went down to Joppa remember this when you are starting to run from God here's the first thing the first thing you do is you start by going down it's a downward place when you start moving from God you start going down and I want to show you this in Israel you know Jerusalem they said let's ascend up to the Mount of God because you literally have to go up the mountain to get to the temple and it speaks of going up whenever you're walking closer to God you're taking a step forward you're taking a step up when you're walking with God you're gonna to go to higher places the path of the righteous gets brighter and brighter unto the noonday but whenever you begin to walk away from God you're taking a step down you're taking a step away from him and his will for your life you're going down the wrong path now Joppa means beautiful so here's Jonah thinking this looks good it looks good but the Bible says there's the way that seemeth right unto a man but the end thereof is the ways of death the word way is a Hebrew word it's the word derek it means course of life mode of action it looks good maybe maybe you're a young person about to be in a relationship and it looks good but it's not God see there's good and then there's God you and, and listen God is good but you want what God has for you you don't want something because it looks good because there's a lot of trouble behind that door I, I have up in a slide our choices without God what's behind door number one a lot of hell and a lot of trouble a lot of hell and a lot of trouble you know in the Bible death means separation death means separation and God doesn't want you to be separated from him sin will separate your family it'll separate you from all the good things in life so again it might look good but we gotta go with the way God wants us to go let's look at the next slide so there are many in the Bible that started their downward spiral by following what looks good. Here's Lot in the Bible. It says in Genesis 13, 10, Lot lifted up his eyes, and behold, all the plain of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, he knew it was a sinful place, but it looked good, so he followed his sight. Let me tell you, as believers, we need to follow the Spirit of God. We need to follow the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God's going to lead you to the green pastures. The Spirit of God's going to lead you where you need to go. Now, the scripture in Romans 8, 14, it says this. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now, the word sons there is a Greek word, euios. It means mature sons of God. In other words, you're, you've come to a place of maturity where you can hear what God is saying to your spirit so you can be led by the Spirit. And God's going to lead you in the right way. Don't be led by the sight of your eyes. Maybe you're offered a job, and the job is in another city. And you say, well, I'm going to take that job. You don't even pray about it. It. And see, God may tell you, no, stay right where you're at. Don't move. I got something better planned for you. Sometimes we take the first thing. You know, the Bible says there's a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I want the perfect will of God. Sometimes we just want to grab the acceptable or the first thing that comes along. We need to wait upon God and let him lead us into the right and good way and what he's got planned for us. God is more excited about your blessing than you. I just know he gets excited when he says, oh, look what I got for my daughter. Look what I've got for my son. He's so excited when we, we you know, you ever have your kids you opening a gift uh, at Christmas and your kids, my, my grandkids will tear the gifts open and I love to watch that. I know even when it's not Christmas, we still have to wrap everything we give my granddaughter. She likes things wrapped. Uh, recently, it looked like Christmas in our house. I said, what are you doing? She said, well, 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 Kate likes everything wrapped. I said, oh, I got it. It's like Christmas all the time. But it's exciting to watch them open it and they go, oh, oh. And this is so exciting. And that's what God, he's so excited over what he's, he wants to bring in your life, the blessings. I'll tell you a funny story. Once it was Christmas time and somebody gave my kids coloring books. And, and, uh, you, know, and you know, you want your kids to be respectful. And they, they ripped it open and went, we don't like it. We don't like it. 
The next year I said, listen, they're going to give you a gift. Don't say that. Just if don't, if don't have nothing good to say. Don't say nothing at all. Okay, Dad. Rip it open. We don't like it. <laughs> they're just brutally honest, right? Let's look at the next slide. Now, Jonah 1.3, he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of God. So he's running from God. Now, Tarshish means the place or the region of the stone or the reverse. So whenever you're taking that first step away from God, you're going away from his will, you're going to the place of the stone or the place of the hard heart. That's exactly what's going to happen. The presence of God is what keeps your heart soft. You know, I often share the bubblegum revelation. When I went to the, visit someone at the hospital, I said, God, what do you want me to tell them? And I was chewing gum, and he had me tell them about bubblegum. I said, you know, the bubblegum, as long as it's in my mouth, it stays soft. But when you take it out of your mouth, you know, kids will stick it under the, uh, they'll, they'd stick it under the pulpit if you couldn't see it, right? They'll stick it somewhere. And it gets hard because of the air. But this is gross, but if you took that hard bubblegum and put it back in your mouth, it gets soft again, right? That's gross, but it would. But God's presence keeps your heart soft before the Lord and tender before God. But when we get out of his presence, we get out of fellowship with the brother, and we get out of the word of God, we get out of worship, man, your heart starts to get hard and callous towards the things of God. So you need to stay in his presence. And here Jonah is going to the place of the region of the stone. 